Hi everyone, welcome to the News from the Real World podcast. My name's Helena. I'm Kelly. I'm Lauren. I'm Chris. I'm Dave. Um, so we'll be discussing a few a selection of articles from the New News from the Real World blog. Um, I'm going to start off with five graphs that show ethnic, racial, and gender makeup of playwrights in the Mark Paper Forum. Um, so this article consisted of several graphs showing different trends in um, particularly their playwright selection. Um, and the really interesting thing about this article was that it wasn't, like, the represent, their representation has not been steadily getting better over time. It has, like, bursts and then valleys, and there's kind of absolutely no historical growth of representation over time. So I found that, because, like, we always think, you know, yeah, you representation is in great theater, but it's slowly getting better. Yeah, you but if you think look at it's this, like a it's, constant rise uh, as opposed to, yeah. you know, that why like I would you would expect this in any sort of structure, but like that the fact that there wasn't like any like this sort of like even plateauing type of thing mm -hmm. was really weird to me. It was also interesting, um, and I was looking particularly at the the gender um, graph, where it it very much it would like spike at certain points, and I was wondering like if that was related to certain you know historical events, like maybe everyone got really freaked out, and they were like, oh no, we have to. You know, have some women playwrights. Fuck, and then, uh, um, and then, and then after, you know, uh, after like they felt like they had fulfilled that, they went back to their normal, you know, yeah. all white men playwrights. Honestly, that kind of feels like it. Um, like even with film, like the past couple years, it's like, oh crap. We gotta really fill our diversity quota for the Oscars. Let's get on that, guys. And then maybe in like two years, we'll just see completely white movies. Again. Yeah, I am really <laughs> interested to see what's gonna happen with the Oscars next year because I feel like definitely this year's, um, like the amount of diversity we had, particularly in the performance awards, was a direct response to the, the year before, and if that's going to be a continuing trend, or if people are just going to stop caring. Yeah, or if they'll be like, oh, well, people of color won last year, so. Yeah. Uh, it's okay. <laughs> well, it could also be um, a response to, like, their successes, though, because the Tabor Theater was also the, like, the location for the world premiere of Angels in America, Back in the early 90s, and yeah. well, after that, they did much more of a queer theater. Yeah, it was play. also um, the the place where Children of a Lesser God premiered for the first time. And so I find it interesting that it's done these kind of groundbreaking um, works in terms of diversity. Children of a Lesser God being a, a, one of the first major disability plays, um, Angels of America being one of the first major queer plays. But even a theater like this, which is known kind of for its representation of minorities, doesn't have a steady growth of it over time. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I found that interesting. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, moving on. Moving right along. Uh, the title of the next article is called Director Performer Resign After Calgary Opera Plans to Cast White Woman for Asian Role, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, but <laughs> what is happening is um, this director slash cast member um, decided to leave the production of South Pacific um, because they cast the, the leading role as a white woman as opposed to a more traditional person of color. Um, and I'm disappointed that this happened, but at the same time, I very much admire um, the director because he stuck to his guns and he, he refused to take part of this performance. Yeah. Um, as opposed to just kind of letting it happen. Mm -hmm. I also found their, their rationalization kind of strange in that they were saying, like, we want someone who's really good at singing and we want a strong voice. Um, and if we, like, and we can't find someone who's of, you know, Asian descent who has that. And I was like, there certainly are people out there. They're just, you know, you don't know of them because you keep casting white people in the roles. Exactly. Well, <laughs> they didn't fully cast them yet, though. They said they were on hold for it. And like the thing that I found interesting is, so they kept on saying, we're trying to find it, we're trying to find it. But like, if it gets to this date, we're going to have to cast her. Mm -hmm. And then the director was just like, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm the, like, so there's sort of like, for me, there was 
while there are a lot of different things where the casting and yeah, you should if you have the available talent to do some of the patient descent in that role, yeah, you need to do that. But the sort of like pulling the trigger a little too fast on like, nope, nope, I'm not gonna try to work with you guys to try to get this solved. I'm just leaving jumping ship would seem like a little bit hair trigger to me. Yeah, it seemed a little strange that like um and, and yes, I find it really problematic that they put the white actress on retainer, like like on hold. She ha she hasn't gotten the role. You're you're yeah. right to point that out. Um, um and I wish the director had kind of because obviously he's the one in this organization who believes the strongest in having the proper representation on stage. So if he had stayed and tried to work with them to find some and, and even pushed them to yeah, you know, but how do you know that he, how do you know that he hasn't? So the thing is, is like what I would like to know is, is how, like how much did the director actually try? Like in the sense that, like he can, we all we know is that he just jumped ship basically, and like, yeah. mm -hmm. like did he actually, did he actually use his resources and his connections to try and find someone that could fill the role to his desires? Like, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously it's not his respons full responsibility to cast the whole show, but like, if he had this. This, if he had this, yeah. this, you know, desire, then he should fulfill. He should at least be, because I mean, the talent is out there. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we've all talked about how the talent is there. It's just a matter of finding I'm, one. And I think, I think the talent is there. It's just really interesting. And for this role in particular, because the role we're talking about is the role of Bloody Mary in South Pacific, which is not only um, a Asian woman and specifically a, top, a Pacific Islander. Um, but also like a middle-aged woman, which is two demographics that you really tend to not see in the entertainment industry. Um, so I'm thinking that like maybe there are, you know, middle-aged women of Asian descent who would be wonderful offer performers, but they've never known that, that is even an option for them. So like mm -hmm. obviously they're not even around to be auditioned. And the other thing like I you know it's like it's sort of like almost a throwaway line and it was um, there's like yeah and we're also Canadian first so that also just like you are like okay so we need a Canadian Asian female mezzo soprano yeah like, it's just yeah. like it just seems like they're coming up with excuses to yeah. not actually try casting an Asian American woman yeah. <laughs> maybe that's why the director left it not as a yeah. like they're not like trying hard enough it's like he knew yeah, at that point, that it wasn't going to happen. Yeah, and they were just saying that, like, oh, we'll wait till this date to say it's safe. They found someone, but wasn't she a soprano or something? Yeah, they they found someone. She just had the wrong uh, vocal okay. range. It's just it's it's a dream when it comes down to like that many criteria. You're like, it's I don't know what to do for you. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, anyway, what were we going to do next? So yeah. Move on to uh, robots. Um, Okay, so <coughs> Disney just put in a um, a new patent filing for uh, wait, let me read this quote real sec quick. Um, a robot that will move and physically interact like an animated character, um, and has been adapted for soft contact and or interaction with a human. Uh, so. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I believe they're starting a new um, exhibit titled "The Uncanny Valley." Okay, <laughs> uh, it's a, it's replacing the haunted mansion next year. So no, one no thing, it's uh, it's called "Have a Nightmare Child." <laughs> <laughs> one thing I, I found super interesting about this article is that um, so it, it framed the entire article around the show Westworld, which is also about um, you know, which is an extremely humans. adult show. Um, yeah. Adult shows. Disney, yeah, yeah, but like this, and like, the the whole author's like whole perspective on this was like, well, if they do, like this is the start of the robot apocalypse, essentially. <laughs> and I was, I found it fascinating that like their whole take was like, well, this is the first step in our demise. Oh, um, also in the conclusion, uh, conclusion paragraph of it, they're like, and now we're gonna have uh, robot brothels. Uh, yeah, no, yeah, um, and it's, you're like, it's, okay, it's not a well um, composed. Um, but like, could you guys see having like actual like soft robots? Like, where would you use them? Like, what type of thing would you want I to use them? I believe this is going to be for a, a Baymax. Okay. Which is like it's humanoid and it's like a fluffy plush white thing. I can't stop thinking um, of it being Ted. 
<laughs> just ten. Like you're gonna have some They're gonna have a teddy ball. bear that's just gonna start roaming Disney campus. Like yeah, are they gonna move? I don't know, I but don't if they know. use them as like normal characters, like roles that real people actually play. I don't why? think we're there yeah. yet. And I mean, and the article made that point that like if they eventually got there, like they'd be putting a ton of people out of work because they'd be like, sorry, so there's this a robot like, there now. Is this kind of like live animation? I don't know. Like, in the has, sense where like you have to program to react to anything that gets thrown at them. Is it like put on a camera to someone's like, oh, It shit. might just be it might just be like a Baymax exhibit where he's got like he's supposed to be a robot and he's obviously a yeah. robot and he's not yeah, I, mean, not I think that well. that might be what's actually happening. I just found yeah. that the author of this article was like saw West that World. that one patent and like got it's ending. Yeah, <laughs> basically, basically got up on his soapbox with his "the world is ending" sign. It's actually, her. Seriously, her. all I can yeah. think about is West World. Like, are they going to program them with a Good Samaritan law? What's uh, happening? I, what I have never. I Westworld's a good show. If you haven't seen really it, I recommend good. it. Great, I'll watch it in my free time. Honestly, all of it. But no, like all of the the drawings and images that they provided for like the actual thing is like Baymax from Big Wheel of Sticks, which is it's an excellent movie, and I it is one of the few characters that could actually be a robot. Just AI is not to the place where it needs to be yeah. to do actual yeah. human interaction. Yeah. On a character level, and they also made the point that like Disney might be like that. It's this patent doesn't mean that anything's about to happen. Yeah, Disney yeah. might be making it just so they yeah, can have the rights over it. You yeah, know, that's twenty kind of, years in the future like when the technology is actually. I feel like yeah. they're just locking in something for. Disney room. would never have used copyright laws though. Never. Disney never. Oh no, they just changed them. <laughs> Yeah, so like, but, but honestly, I think the best product for this technology is a Baymax-ish yeah. kind of thing because Baymax is an actual android in the film, as opposed to like don't don't look at him. He's so cute, and he's based off of a robot that we developed here. That's cute. That's cute. And you, we go to CMU, by the way. That's um, adorable. Yeah. Classmates who are watching this. <laughs> Chris. <laughs> Um, okay. Uh, so let's talk about an article on Gantt charts and reasons why you should use them. I mean, yeah. Seventeen. Uh, you can tell that you care about Gantt charts a lot. Gantt charts are. Lauren, I know you do, considering you've planned out your entire life on one. But where do you start us off? Um. Well, Gantt, I. I use like a bastardized Gantt chart for my like you do here. daily. Thanks, yeah, Holmes. almost exactly like you do here. Thanks, David Holcomb. Um, David Holcomb just came over there. Oh, I thought David Holcomb brought it brought over from somewhere else. Whatever, it was David. Oh, no, no, it was David. Okay, anyway. But David brought it here. A David brought it here, one <laughs> of the many. Um, but no, they're excellent. You can like see where you are in the process. It's good for more complex things if you. I know Helena uses an actual Gantt chart for her life. Do you guys agree with this point? One of the major, I, I actually wrote a comment on this, and one of the uh, one of the things that I touched on was how they say it's easy to understand, and for me, I personally disagree with that because it, like, even just yeah. looking at the example that they give in the article, not that you can see it, but uh, it just like. I would need some form of explanation, even to just get a minor yeah. understanding of it. It's yeah. it's not um, a no training required. Yeah, uh, and I'm sure the thing. article I'm sure the article is kind of, uh, but it's also hinting upon that. Like they do say that, like obviously you're not just gonna walk in. But it says anything. here that it's project managers and senior uh, like stakeholders can easily understand it. Yeah, I think Which, it's one of those like, things where they're yeah. assuming you've already been trained to yeah. read it, yeah. and then once you have that training, it's a little easier, yeah. like it's mm -hmm. easy to spot it and walk Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good. My biggest issue with the Gantt chart is, there's for me at least, there's not enough um, vertical guidelines. So if I'm looking at a show that's all the way down on one of the lower rungs of our season, and I'm just trying to find the date, when strike starts, I usually lose my place all the time. Yeah, it's when they start growing like really, really long. You're like, what day is this? Yeah. What's happening? And I think that's something that's a little bit unique about our Gantt chart in particular. 
It's just the sheer amount of information we have on ours mm -hmm. can, some kind, can sometimes kind of get, like, it's overwhelming. Uh, the lack of vertical lines was also done for, like, formatting. Yeah. yeah. Whereas, like, I, the one that I use for, like, my light and, like, organizing that, I have a vertical line for every day. Mm -hmm. And then I have a different vertical line for the week. Do you think that it improved your time management? as far as having a general under, like, so for you, Lauren, like, mm -hmm. do you, like, seeing, like, being able to step back and see your entire schedule at a, a glimpse, is that, is that something that actually helps? Yes and no. Mm -hmm. um, it helps me keep track of everything really easily, and I can see, like, conflicting due dates, and I can see, like, when it's going to be hard and when I should start working, and I can plan out when I should start working, but should, <laughs> <is> <laughs> <in> <laughs> <there>. <laughs> but should is in there. Yeah. Um, I mostly use the Gantt chart because it's easy for me to, like, guilt trip myself when I procrastinate and, like, end up doing a lot of work the night before because I can look at when I should have started it and when I, like, when it would have been, like, timely, and I knew this was coming up, and, like, look at this month-long bar that, like, when I should have been working on this research paper, and yet I'm still doing it in its almost entirety the night before. Not um, like a good guilt trip to uh, drive home that you should have worked earlier. <laughs> yeah, I also wonder with this article, because it seems like the author framed the entire thing. <laughs> I have a lot of sauce in my hair. Framed the entire thing, um, like, the Gantt charts are no longer being used, which I found confusing because... What else would you use then? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm kind of wondering like if any of you know like what he's assuming is I think it kind of means that I, th I think that he means that it's like uh, people, people are starting to shy away from the more traditional Gantt chart and like people like like CMU drama where they're kind of adapting it to fit their specific needs. Like I know one thing that we focus on is uh, you know, like, how many shows we have going on at one time. So, like, how many shows we have on in the shop <coughs> at one time. Can you, you can kind of see, like, how many shows are in build, what's in pre-build, what's in budget. So, like, the coordination. And that's kind of, like, one of the points that the author talks about is, uh, you know, you know, fosters better coordinate, uh, coordination. So, yeah. so, I mean, like, it's... Gantt, the traditional Gantt chart works really well when you have like one or two large projects yeah. with a lot of stuff. Yeah. But when you've got like 20 a year, you might as well just, you need to change something. <laughs> you need to get a little less detail and then do a different thing. I for wonder, that the interesting thing about yeah. us is we have so many projects, yeah. but they, you know, every project has the same exact structure to yeah. them. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. all the, however many pages, what not. Well, you can debate that schoolwork is also a project. Yeah. Like you, it's, yeah. but yeah. But there are games. That Where's that on my But that would have to be on an individual level, That's not on an institutional individual. level. Yeah. So I wonder if there would be a way that we can, you know, condense our specific Gantt chart into, instead of having it, although it's nice to see individual lines, yeah. so you, I could, mean, you, could, you could make it smaller because, you know, every Rao show has the same exact time frame, uh, you know, plus footprint. or minus, footprint, yeah. plus or minus, you know, uh, a couple days or holidays or whatever it might be. But, you know, essentially it's just repeating. Like every row show that we have is essentially just, you know, like even when we, when I was rebuilding our calendar, I noticed that it was just like a copy paste. And then, right. you know, you, oh, you got to count for the weekends and day yeah. shifts. But like, yeah. other than that, it's virtually the same exact thing. Also, it's interesting to me because like I've started using this software that's, um, I can't turn it online, and it's like the first time I've ever found a Gantt chart effective because it also like tracks percentage done, and like it'll show you oh, uh, nice. your how much you have to do every day, um, yeah. and like color codes the different places you're busy and whatnot. And so like that's the first time I've ever found a Gantt chart to be actually helpful. Whereas like that's actually I look at you know our big paper calendar yeah. Gantt chart, and I'm like, okay, that's, like, that's <laughs> actually software is that. It's called Team Gantt. It's Team Gantt. <laughs> That's actually a really interesting point. I wonder how many, like, now that we, you know, technology has been so developed, I wonder, you know, if that's, away from? If, if that's, if that's why, and if that's why we, like, see less and less Gantt charts. Because, I mean, that's, like, the first Gantt, I, I actually, I've never heard of a yeah. Gantt chart software before. 
I, I like you know now people use you know their Google calendars, which is like, which is not a Gantt chart at all, but it works for people. You know, so maybe maybe we'll start to see more more of these Gantt chart online technologies because like that percentage done and like you know remaining whatever like remaining is like it's, definitely it's a useful helpful. is yeah. a definitely a useful feature and it's not something that you can get on paper, but. Uh, yeah. Like a sharpie and a whiteboard. Doesn't it also send you like a to do list every morning? Yes, yeah, so it'll send you a to do list, um, like for items you have to do tomorrow, and it'll show you what percentage done. And it's in an email. Oh, it's really cool. good. Oh, I recommend it. Okay. Trying to get my sponsorship. It <laughs> um, yeah, it's free for you. Can have one project raised right now. I just have a project that's on my homework. Um, mm -hmm. If you want multiple projects, it's like a monthly um, subscription. Oh, look at you. I think we're going. Right. Uh, which oh, wow, <laughs> that was a lot of talk about a chart. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's pers sure. personal organization is the most important thing that you can do. Well, so, or so I've been told. I mean, there's also doing things that keep you alive. Yeah, not good. necessary. You put them on the game. As long as you organize your food, then you can eat it. I actually know I do. I have like grocery shopping and like cooking on my game chart. Oh my. That is because otherwise I just don't lot. do it. Okay, Dan, anyway. it's your turn. Dan, <laughs> <Dave>, please. Okay. <laughs> so it's my turn. Uh, the article I'm going to start with is uh, Cosplayers Influence the Costume Design in Star Wars Animated Show. So cool. Star Wars is making an animated show? I mean, other than the Clone Wars? <laughs> I mean, yeah, the, the, extend, the extended universe of Star Wars is kind of... So they have Clone Wars different. and Rebels right now? Mm -hmm. And this was cool, because they basically come out and they say that seeing all the fan art and seeing all the people who like do stuff going to all the Comic-Cons and whatnot, that like they're not just like, no, we're ignoring you. And there was like, no, like we watch that because we think we want to see what you guys think is comfortable. We want to see what yeah. you guys are doing and they like adapt it because like if you bring something that looks really cool, we're kind of gonna borrow some yeah, of their influence because it's, it's from the fans. Yeah, which so is amazing. You, it was like it was a cool <laughs> old nod where part of me was kind of afraid when they, they bought Star Wars. <laughs> And I was like, is this, this gonna, we all? is this this gonna be just straight corporate and like lose that sort of like little bit of soul that was Star Wars? Yeah, before or after the prequels? Uh, yeah, before Jar Jar Binks uh, existed. <laughs> oh, I used to love Jar Jar, Jar Binks. Killed the soul. Five year old Lord Jar Jar Binks. Jar Jar Binks. Right? Jar Jar Binks no. was uh, the demon in. <laughs> you wouldn't cosplay the Jar Jar. No, I would not. <laughs> You'd get beat up. <laughs> I believe I'm pretty sure I would be put into a Chewbacca outfit. What if you put a, a Jar Jar Binks costume and then like an arrow? Oh, this is completely off topic. Okay, it is. Well, well, a little off topic. Well, yeah. like, the one thing that was I found really cool about this was thinking about are there any other like sort of like shows or things like really comics that like so use well. that and like use a lot yeah. of that like can you guys think of any? I mean, I know in general it tends towards the like um, superheroes, to, like sci fi world. So I feel like Marvel might do some of that. I mean, I know I've definitely watched interviews with not specifically like Marvel themselves, but like directors who have directed Marvel movies who have talked about like the cosplay and the fans and are they're very conscious of that and like how much those fans care because oh, they yeah. care so much. But it seems, it seems easier for superhero movies because they have so much source material mm -hmm. to to gather costume information from whereas um, whereas yeah. with the animated Star Wars they're just kind of playing it by ear and they're like I don't know I think I think there's a, a better reason to use cosplay ideas for Star Wars as opposed to a superhero movie well, yeah they did do like a little bit of, with like the whole cosplayer sort of influence in Deadpool, where a lot oh. of the different things like Deadpool is a huge thing that happens. Almost every Comic Con has multiple Deadpools, and boy pranks, and everything, different crazy outfits. So like they kind of brought that in a little bit. So like I feel like you do see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know if I've ever um, heard of like a items being specifically designed with cosplay in mind, which I found this really, really yeah. interesting. Like, they, like the, I, I think it might have been the actual costume designer, but someone was um, talking about like making the clothes wearable for normal people, like, and they were actively yeah. thinking about that while they designed the costume. 
so cool. And I also find it awesome is that they brought like so the <laughs> 501 First Legion worldwide costuming group. They was like, yeah, you guys been kind of like big in this whole spiel. You kind of like it a little bit, just a little. Mm -hmm. We're gonna bring you on stage and give you also a head on. So like, it, it was a lot of I liked it because it was a lot of respect for the fans and yeah. feeding back to the people who actually got them there. And yeah. which, which I really like because um, we touched on a little bit earlier. Like, like I feel like that is very much where Star Wars started. You know, yeah. when like George Lucas was out in the desert, like filming small no. little. Nobody you know the originals on two dollars. <laughs> well, the first one um, was not meant to be part of any series. After it had been released, and he's like, "Oh, people like it. Oh, oh. let's slap <laughs> another on that one." <laughs> yeah, and then like with the prequels, I feel like it really went downhill. But I like that. Like, I feel like the Star Wars universe has kind of come come back in a way mm -hmm. to us. They didn't respond to it because I mean, like the topic of Jar Jar Binks and the thing had like a whole like plot designed around Jar Jar, like he had a family and like yeah. cares and then no. like they released the movie and everyone hated him. They were like, oh, never mind. There's a reason for it. <laughs> oh, uh, but but it, I would say it is so nice to see um, um, film actually taking, like doing it for the fans. Mm -hmm. as opposed to doing it for the producers or the studio or the money. It seems like they, they genuinely care about giving the fans what they want. Yeah, yeah. in comparison to some other productions. Yeah, like, and it's not just like the story, because it's also like some of the Jedi cops and whatnot, yeah. where it's like, we're not just going to make <laughs> so Shoshka, uh one of the female Jedi and everything, and we're not, we're not just going to make it a skimpy bikini clad, like, no, no, we're gonna actually make something you can wear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so, um, I think we should probably move on from that. Oh, that's really cool. Star Wars is the best thing to ever come out of this world. Uh, I, that's, that's, that's a stretch. stretch. I mean, I'm not gonna say I disagree with you, but it might be a stretch. Because I'm in the world, so. <laughs> yeah. That statement oh. is inherently false. Uh, <laughs> Okay, shot fired. Um, all right, so this next article is about the Broadway Green Alliance, um, and they're announcing their winners of uh, the College Green Captain Contest. Um, the winners are Olivia um, Rancine, who was the Green Captain at Indiana, in Indiana University, and um, Chloe Martins, who's the Green Captain at Drew University. Um, so I really like this program, um, and I think we're starting to implement it here a little bit. Yeah. Um, actually tried to get in touch with some of the green captains. Um, and we're doing a little bit of stuff, but I also, um, I know particularly for our world, making it greener is very, very difficult. Yeah. I sent Ben Carter actually an email early at the start of the semester because I was interested in like what we might be able to do. Um, and he just sent me back this like paragraph, like the longest email I've ever gotten from a CMU <laughs> faculty member of just like all the stuff we do wrong and why there's no way to fix it. And I was like, you're so sad. And I'm so sad with you. Yeah, like just even hearing the terms Broadway and Green Alliance coupled together is just infeasible. Like we waste so much. Yeah. Fact, how, how could we I, ever go green? I think it, it helps that this program is specifically, it, it feels like it's, cause it's mostly led by actors. It's specifically focused on like rehearsal process and rehearsal rooms. And that's a lot easier to green than the production yeah. side of things. Yeah. Which or is where, like, where know, the big waste Or trash out. Yeah. Like, like the, the right way. The thing that I find interesting is like, like even just being here at CMU where like we try to be green, like it's just ingrained in the nature of like we when we just did shop clean out, we threw out like Everything. so much stuff that was just, you know, not bad at all. Like we were pulling out throwing out full sticks of lumber just like and because the, and like the question goes of like, okay, I built the set, we did our show. Now the show's closing. What do you do with that set? And I I know there's been multiple times where like you try to store it someplace, and you're like, okay, now this room. is collecting dust. Now I don't have the room. Yeah. Yeah. You're never going to do that exact production. Yeah, the really problem is that it's, it's always going to be so specific, specific that you can't really reuse. Yeah. However, I, mean, I think there are 
chunks that we can reuse. Like, I personally think it's absurd that we don't keep any of our stair units. Yeah. At all. I mean, I mean especially it's like, oh, we made, now, we made these um, stairs, because, they're trash. Because starting last year, we got a whole other floor of the warehouse just for storage, we, where we could potentially store bigger units like that. Although getting them would be, an in, there would be an interesting challenge. I mean, to, to be honest, we are like so much worse than Broadway because like we turn we turn and burn shows like they're, it's going out. At of least they sit yeah. there for a while. Like yeah, yeah, like like Broadway so, productions. You know, I mean, when things break, they fix them. When, when for us, it's over. We throw it away. Like you know, like like we like we are throwing away perfectly good. Thing. Like, yeah, all like, of its structural I mean, integrity is still there. And also, yeah. like, it's, it's just it's still painted. material. I mean, I remember I was talking with um, Jenna, one of our lighting design students, about uh, this issue uh, earlier in the semester, and she was saying, like, even if we couldn't, you know, reuse it ourselves, is there any program we could set up where it could be used to make, like, um, you know, yeah. housing for homeless Or, uh, like, send it to a high school. Like, well, that's what, really like well, that's what we're, we're trying to do that with um, Adam. Yeah. Because he comes in at all of our yes. strikes and uh -huh. he takes like what he can use for yeah, so which, really bad. which I really yeah. like because like that at least is like, okay, we can't use this anymore. Maybe you guys can enter. And not, yeah, and not only is yeah. it is it like are we being like more green, but completely off topic. We're we're like I know my, I know if that was my high school, that would have been amazing. Like we. Yeah. We, we were like anything. we could barely buy. You yeah, know, I mean, I mean, buy the, the, the whole escape room project that Julian and I did was built out of boom. That yes, was that exactly. was the boom set. Got you. Yeah. <laughs> so no, like, the, um, even when we can reuse it like one more time, like I think that's like yeah. it's, it's just better than. It's it just such a harsh contrast yes. here versus my undergrad because at every strike, every stick of lumber that was more than six feet long, we pulled staples out of. It all. We reuse those pieces. We were meticulous about getting all the staples out so it can be used and I, yeah. for the next set. I think the, honestly, I think the problem here is that we have the money to buy the new material. Yeah, so, so like it's, it. it's also labor time. We're yeah. working on so many things. It's, it's labor work. time, and it's just we're working on so many things. Yeah. So like versus like because I've also like worked like shows where I would strike a set and save every single screw as long yeah. as it wasn't completely stripped. And you just threw yeah. everything into it, like you just have five gallon buckets everywhere on deck. Yep. And you're just throwing things into five gallon buckets. I've seen all the time. And like, yeah, it's good to reuse it, but there's also nothing more frustrating when you try to reuse that again and it strips. But like that eats so much time. Yeah. And you can only really do that if you're only working with one show at a time. I yeah. Feel. Yeah. I definitely don't think it would be feasible the way we currently yeah, I've, are. I've literally seen people here, like, take handfuls of screws and just be like, I don't want to sort these. And they're like, haven't even been used. And they're like, they someone just like put them all out because they were using them. And then they were just like, yeah, I don't want to sort these. Yeah. And they just threw all of them away, like hundreds. What I'd be intrigued yes. to see is that could we take, like, instead of, like, if we're not going to reuse the hardware, let's say it's stripped or in the case of bolts, we have way too much. Yeah, like, mm -hmm. can we, yeah. instead of tossing it, take it to recycling it? Is it too small to do that? Because it could no, probably because, be melted down. And, yeah. yeah, because that, that aluminum um, shop that we, I still have the words for it. The, the, uh, the yeah, the place that we, uh, not the scrapyard, but the place that we went with Ben to oh, like yeah. see the stock. They were like, yeah, we sh oh, no, we no. save our kerf and like our like shavings from when we cut and then we recycle that. So like obviously nothing yeah. is too small. And yeah. like that would be so, something that, yeah. it's a small step, but yeah. a step it's, to I mean, shuffle. You, honestly, <laughs> we would almost have to hire on another staff member to just be like recycling. Yeah. Or like, just yell like, at people in the shop. Like, honestly, yeah. Full time yeah. and sorter and, point, and storer and recycler. Well, it was, and at that it, point, it would just be not worth it. It is. Well, it is interesting because like, <laughs> like when I emailed um, Ben Carter, I was, I was expecting to get like a few thoughts or whatnot, but like I didn't realize he was so passionate about this issue. And I guess what has happened is that he's just kind of like. Realize that people aren't going to follow it if you make the suggestion. There's yeah. a sense of like just apathy at a certain point because you keep trying to fight it. And then, like, I remember we had the one class and David Bovers was just like, Yeah, what can we do? Like, this is a great thing for like using better energy sources and all these different things. But when it comes down to it, 
what can we do with our set? Like, can we, you can't just sort of uncut wood. Yeah. Like, then yeah. the question is, like, also the materials we use. If we took all the metal out of it and threw it into a wood chipper, could we use it? Is that wood safe to use as mulch or anything? Like, yeah, or like, it's got like glue I mean, and all everything. the dirt that we use for Playboy, we had to toss because we put um, glycerin in it. Yeah, so like, oh. there's other stuff where it's just like, yeah. we I change think... stuff so it's not really that friendly. So even like, if you were to try to be like, well, here's a creative way to try to use this again. It's like, no, can't do it. Yeah. I think it's going to come down to like, really small steps, like the thing you were saying about the, the recycling screws and hardware and whatnot, and like just the more more of those that we can implement, because I don't know that there is like one big solution, you know? I think it's also going to come down to the improvement in the technology of materials. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Once that technology of materials and like you find greener materials mm -hmm. starts getting out there, where even if you don't necessarily are able to use it twice as it's like an original form, that like if you're throwing it out or recycling it or doing anything to it, you can repurpose it. Or even like just finding a way to take <clears throat> the material that we already have and just reuse them again. Like having like finding some kind of like again like a wood chipper or something, and then literally just having a machine in the shop where you just like pour everything in and it just like throws out sheets of MDF or something. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, that would be ideal. All the hours, but we're running a little low on time. Yeah. Oh. Um, so, sorry, that was a really engaging conversation that I look forward to continuing. 3D printers. Um, <laughs> are they more efficient, though? My next article <laughs> is called, The Las Vegas Nightclub is Getting Turned into an Esports Arena. And, like, when I first read this, I was like, great, I hate nightclubs, get rid of them all. But, <laughs> um, I hate it. Um, but this is actually... This is cool. It's like feeding into the the more gamer friendly world that we're entering into. So they're um, replacing this thirty thousand square foot nightclub, and they're just turning it into a venue to play esports e games. Biggest land party ever. Like, you look very yeah, excited. Like, <laughs> like multi level people can come in and out. It's, it, they're making it sound like there will always be something available to play. Yeah, it's a oh. casino for gamers. It's Vegas. Like, <laughs> it's. Yeah. I don't think you're running a new creative place. Like, I see. This is the thing. Like, like this. Like, like, are you surprised? No, it's no, Vegas. I think like, it's cool. Like, it's awesome. I think it's awesome, but I don't yeah. think that means that they're going to like start popping up like and I think everywhere. I think it'll be everywhere. less used as a um, well, like a casino for gamers and more of like a place to host like competition. That, that's what it's for. And uh, that's the thing you're saying, not popping up everywhere. The thing I found interesting, um, which I didn't realize, was that this isn't something that's starting here. It's actually a huge trend in Asia, as oh, yeah. the article was oh, saying. Oh, my God. And yeah. that, like, it's now just entering the U.S. What's the national sport of South Korea? I don't know, man. Starcraft. Oh, my Starcraft God. is quite literally the national sport. Yeah. Yes. No. Yeah. Video I'm... games are kind of a big deal in other countries. And, like, oh, that's yeah. part of the reason why, like, what is it now? PBS, I think, is now doing, like, hosting e-sports, like, actual competitions where you can watch, like, people playing Counter-Strike or, uh, League of Legends. Oh, no, it's so cool. It's, it's actually, like, it's kind of funny. My dad hates trying to, like, watch video games. He gets confused, but, like, it was really funny because we're, like, watching it and, like, scrolling through the channels and he just, like, turns on and goes, what is this? <laughs> what is this? And, like, he just sits there staring at it and just, like, hyperly engaged for a good, like, yeah. hour and stuff. He's just, like... I didn't even know you would get this. <laughs> like, exactly. Like, I watch speed cool. runs that yeah. are, like, two and a half oh, hours long, so cool. and you're just it's watching, like, and you're like, oh, what? That's amazing. And then you look at the clock, and you're like, oh, oh, boy. What is it, like this? I have been watching this for this two and a half hours. Minutes. And I think, like, <laughs> like, Super Mario 64. <laughs> yeah. I think, the of, I think the appeal of it is that, like, you know, somebody is playing that live. Like, yeah. 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 Like, yeah you know, it, sure. it's, it's, like, an entertaining, like, for, like, people... For like sports, I know like can sometimes get like mundane, like you know, like aren't like the same, just like re like re reoccurring. But like this is like ever changing. Like you're you're constantly watching somebody. Like you have no idea what's gonna happen. 
Yeah. It's completely every like, game is different. Yeah, every I guess you could say it about like, sports. And like so everyone like, is good at a game yeah. as well, whereas sports has like a very like a very real physical <laughs> requirement and like yeah. threshold. Whereas like a video game, like anyone can play. Well, a video you know, like game. it still takes reflexes and all those yeah. different things. Oh but, yeah, like, but like, the thing that I think is interesting, I think it's interesting because of the fact that like you bring up sports and you think about like part of the reason why people like sports and watching it is because like. I remember when I was playing that, and like, they yeah. like being able to mimic it. And I feel like that with the esports, it's like I play video games. Well, here's like someone who can do it horrendously better than I. Yeah, they would just roll on me. Like, I, I mean, there's there's the very human thing of like we like to watch people do stuff that can do it very well. Yeah, we like watching people who are better than us. Yeah, like I love watching, you know, Sean or someone build a shop or like DR oh, do yeah. carpentry. Like yeah. I can I could watch DR use the table saw for like hours. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like what said, we really like watching that. What was it? Um they had like the lumberjack competitions where you like watch it, you're just like oh, if you were gosh. to take any of this and just like tell someone to do it. It would be probably the most boring thing in existence no, to like, watch. Awesome. And then you put two people who are horrendously good at it, you're just like, what? Yeah, or like even <laughs> ice road truckers, where it's like, I could I, never do that. Yeah, or like like anything on the Discovery Channel where you're like, oh, like let's go in, let's like let's go into my local like gas station and just start filling the workers. Like that's essentially what like what, what gas monkey garage was. Right. They're just like like they're car mechanics and like it's so on good. TV, but like it's funny and it's cool and it's like yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. like it's cool. To to cool. wrap this up, I just think it's I think it's interesting how um, it's a growing market. How much more the yeah the world is becoming more gamer friendly and more as, accepting that as as an entertainment industry if that makes sense as yeah. well. Yeah. Oh, it, um, it is. Because like. So like I know, I know for a long time, like, there are people who do, like, video games or video game commentary on uh, YouTube, and, like, outside of that small community, everyone was like, what? Why is this entertaining? Well, I don't know. Prize money for, like, competitions is also huge. So, like, oh, yeah. people are realizing there's money to be made in this market, and they're going to start yeah. acting accordingly. Yeah, because John Walker plays competitive video games. He won, like, $5,000 at the start of the yeah. semester. Like, is it the card uh, Hearthstone for uh, World of Warcraft? Their whole Blizzard spiel. Like I had my one buddy who played that competitively and like got a yeah. couple wins. He was like, "Oh wow, you it, can actually make some decent money on this." It's incredible, stuff. Um, Lauren. We should we should probably move on. We should. Um, Never. So keep this train rolling. Going off of the fun subject of video games, <laughs> when a censored play was already in violation of copyright. So uh, just for some, there's a, a play was put up at a high school that uh, some parents like went on stage and like dragged their kid, or metaphorically dragged their kid off and like demanded that like the show stop. Um, and the parents uh, on Facebook claimed that the play consisted of extreme amounts of cursing, drug use, and sexually explicit content. There was language speaking about dildos, pornography, virgins, and cherry popping. A student flipped off to a teacher and. Um, uh, this play is an illegal adaption of um, The Breakfast Club. Obviously, a very, uh, oh, so God. very a crazy heinous, a heinous show. So, yeah, so Breakfast that's the Club. thing that I find crazy about this article is that it's a very famous movie. And it's pretty yeah. old. And, yeah, so, like, the fact that, like, and also they talk about how the parents were given a permission slip. Like, every child had to have a permission signed with, sign with their parents to be in this play. So outside of all the copyright issues, which are obviously large and there, yeah. um, the fact that like it took them until you know ten minutes into the first act to realize that all this content was in this yeah, play, like you have to guess is that, mind blowing. Like you had to guess that the parents have seen the Breakfast Club it came out least, during their time, exactly, they or not? at least have heard about it. It's enough. not like it's a famous coming of age movie or anything. Yeah. Like oh, I don't yeah. know. Like it's just like. How what? do you not know the context? What did in they this? think I this mean, interpretation I was gonna be? <laughs> I didn't know Breakfast Club was a film until Pitch Perfect came out. Oh so. God! <laughs> that, Lauren, mom, why, uh, we could no longer be friends. Uh, uh, I want to yeah. be very clear. My mom, that. my mom, like, was like, you have to watch Breakfast Club at the age of like an early age. I don't know, but <laughs> but, but like you know, and, like the fact that it like had like a little bit of. It's got a little bit of curse, but it's not even like. Okay, like they smoke weed. Um, uh, 
Um, Ali Sheedy's character drop, dumps out her purse and she's got tampons in it. Oh. Um, they talk about how each of them got into detention and the most graphic one is... Um, yeah, and the... Oh, the thing oh, that they don't uh, even talk about is the... Third. No, it's... Well, no, no. It's the jock where he just beat a guy bloody in a locker room. Yeah. But, yeah, but the... I, I found it interesting, I guess they didn't get to that protected play, but like, there's also a, a suicide attempt talked about in that yeah. play. And yeah. they... Oh, yeah. Good. Because yeah. high schools are obviously not, there's no cursing, there's nothing, like, there's, honestly, it's absolutely no. all rainbows and sunshine. And you yeah. never see any cursing in the outside world either that yeah. would lead high school students to be like that in and high school. I, like, it's oh, just, definitely not. Why? Wait, actually, why do yeah. you have to curtail it? Like, and, like, and like, why do you have to like, like, why are people attacking high schools, like, and like, no high school student is struggling with, like, the choice between marrying an Austrian captain and going into a nunnery. Like, these are issues that high schoolers are actually struggling with. Like, like, I don't find it... I think yeah. we do have to readdress, like, they definitely shouldn't have done this show, because they definitely don't have the rights. They... Oh, yeah, no. They no, screwed, it's they screwed up so royally, and, like... Well, oh, but no, 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 it's okay. We're not actually charging for tickets. We just have a five dollars suggested donation. <laughs> there's, there's no theatrical script, so uh, here's yeah, what we're gonna do. We're gonna give uh, some music script, and we're gonna give it to one of our uh, drama teachers, and he's just gonna, uh, he's gonna do it. Yeah, he's just he's not stealing it. He's just putting those words onto his computer to distribute to the students. And then, but we're not making money. Receiving donations. Yeah. So, so I found it interesting with like with the, all the copyright issues. Like whether I, I wonder whether or not the, the fact that they decided to not after the performance was cut short, not to continue it, had more to do with the copyright issues or had more to do with the the content and the parents being upset. Because one of those I find unreasonable, and one of those I don't. Honestly, I don't think one high school's poor production of The Breakfast Club will even like make a little blip. On copyright laws, I mean, it's it's illegal, yes, but are they really going to crack down on a high school play? I honestly think it was the parents who ruined it. Who owns it? it? It's Warner Brothers. Or I mean, no, like no matter what you do, parents want to play. Playing. That is correct. Um, it's Missouri. It, it was in Missouri. Oh, that's your issue. <laughs> hey, just, I'm from that area. Yes, I've lived in that area. It's just I don't know, like it. It gets to a point where, like, yeah, you don't have the rights to do the show, so yes. So we'll take that off the board. But if you're doing a show similar, original content, and it has most of those themes, why the fuck can't you do that? Like, because it's high school and children must be protected from the gruesomeness of the outside but world. Like, like, also, like, the things that we accept just because they're in a, in, like, Guys and Dolls has a stripper in it. And oh, they're burlesque or something. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. Like, like, the amount of, like, content that is in musicals that we just, like, are like, oh, this is fine because it's in the canon. But the minute you put that same content in, like, an original or contemporary play and have high schoolers do it, people yeah. freak out. But it's also, like, censoring work like that also makes it harder for people who are in high school to talk to their parents and talk to people about yeah. the issues. Because certain things... Are kind of important to bring up. Yeah, because like, these issues are the issues that, are, issues that are actually relevant to the students. And that's yes. the point I was trying to make earlier with the sound of music analogy is that like the plays we make high schoolers do have kind of no application to their actual lives and like can't give them, whereas like we censor them from doing Show plays that, that bring up issues that they actually like matter to them. I can't wait to see another version of Guys and Dolls or Sing in the Rain and Sound of Music. Like, it's just okay. Oklahoma. That's really poignant to everyday life. Like, no. Oh, okay. I mean, it, there's a lot of racism in Oklahoma, so you could argue that it's. Um, All right, let's let's, let's, yeah. let's cool down a little bit. Let's move on. <laughs> uh, change, change the direction just a little bit. Uh, so my uh, my article is titled "A Second Bite of the Wonka Bar." Ah, uh, yes, because Charlie. Willy Wonka wasn't already terrifying enough. Yeah. Reimaging Charlie for Broadway. Broadway. Mm. Dave, yeah. I know you said you had a, a friend that was. Yeah, um, yeah. I have a, one of my friends was working on it. And she said it was a real fun, kind of like stressful because like this was her first Broadway musical which she worked on, and she was just like, it was crazy, but like 
it's it's Willy Wonka. It's everything. Like it's crazy. It's a magical world, and trying to bring that to stage would be really damn hard. And people die. Um, well, yeah, that was one thing I found interesting is that they like they are they're. they're it's it's obviously like whimsical and magical in the way that Wonka is, but they also like like the the source material and like the story of Willy Wonka is quite dark, and they've like definitely pushed that as well with like yeah. having the bubblegum girl explode, not Ooh, just like yeah. blow up, and like having the other girl mauled and torn apart by squirrels. So like yeah. one thing that I found really interesting, not that it was mentioned in the article, but just about this topic in general was as a technical director, like this show in general, kind of reminds me of a Cirque du Soleil show, just in the sense that there's, like, so much going on, and there's so many technical aspects happening on stage that, like, just the sheer amount of opportunity that comes from a production like this must have just been amazing. Because, like, it's not every day that you bring, like, a complete, like, a world like this to sta- to the stage. Like, it's happened before, but, like, with the advances of automation now and what we can do with you know, scenery, I think that a, like, this is, like, that was probably one of the main reasons why we see a production like this actually come to stage because of the opportunity. Then you just, like, think of, like, all the ways that the kids either (laughs) die or get taken out of the factory, like, like, (laughs) how do you get someone to blow up to the size of a giant blueberry, like, or, like, the stretch, the stretcher, Whatever. Yeah. 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 Or like, how do you? How, like, I can just see it right now. Like, we had this flying actor with like, just like I don't know, some kind of like, Costuming like belt, something. yeah, some kind of like really long thing, and she's just like walking along, and she has like two people in her legs or yeah. something. Like, it's amazing, and like, like, like even when you watch the movie, like, like as a technical director, you like, how could I bring that to stage? And like, mm-hmm. they finally like, found how the it. hell did you manage to? Yeah, do that? I'm like, sure it was really cool. cool. Yeah, I mean, I think that's. Um, because, like, obviously the, the other um, play that's so much that is about on Broadway is Matilda, and I know there's a lot of, like, elements like that in Matilda where they were like, yeah. how were we... Oh, four times. Are they both dogs? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they're both yeah. dogs. Oh, yes, the nightmare. <laughs> I had so many, like, terrifying dreams as a kid because of this. Yes. And I'm, I mean, I, have, I know I had a friend who really, like, loved Matilda. She had seen it, like, a million... Like three, uh, three or four uh, um, on Broadway. Three or four million. Yes. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> and like she would tell me about, you know, like the moment when the girls were like sw- on the swings going out over them, like all like the oh, amazing technical yeah. elements. And they just make it like it's it's magical. And the, I, I don't know, the way that I think. And I feel like the dark humor, yeah, yes, because like they were able to take the what characters that were like child or the children from the movie and they're having. Adults play them. Yeah, they're having adults play all of them except Charlie, which is very interesting. Huh, yeah. But I think it, that has to add to, like, Wonka being the bad character to yeah. Charlie, which is surprising. But, like, because of that, they were able to do a little bit more uh, gruesome deaths, apparently. So it's added in both, like, this sort of. Exploding. <coughs> Exploding people. Yeah, like, it's added yeah. in both this, like, young, magical world, and then also, like, a little bit of the darker humor for older audiences where they want to both see that like world from their childhood but like let's just see a little but, but you're yeah. adult you're yeah. an adult yeah. so and you it, know about consequences yeah. and I mean <laughs> yeah. there is like kind of this this element of like uh, fear that ha- in like in like the the chocolate factory like you go in like this magical place but there's also like these incredibly dark everything can kill you yeah, and so like I, I'm just thinking of the the moment in the Gene Wilder movie with the tunnel, and like the story I I, I heard about that was that the Gene Wilder was the only actor in that scene who knew what was going to happen. So like yes. all like the fear and confusion that you see on all the other actors, that's like that's amazing. Real. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, many nightmares. Moving forward. See, you want to finish us up? So finishing up with a wonderful little article called "Screw That." Oh. More or less, uh, to get it, the g- get it done yields some of the ugly tool related injuries. Can you relate? Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> Most wholeheartedly, yes. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think every time I've seen someone get hurt badly in a shop, it's because they were, you know, rushing or out of time and just. Or, or and this was, attention, or careless. this is, there's one point that he brings up, which is when you know you're about to leave for the night, and then you're like, oh, I could just do one more thing to get ahead for the night. 
Don't and you're not it. and you're not prepared to do it and like the work will be there in the morning. And like there's yeah. times where like doing strikes overnight and you're like, I only have this time frame. The next show needs to come in. And it always, always I I, I don't think I've ever left a strike without like not like major injuries, but like I'm gonna have something like now I have scratches on my forearm because I was yeah. just like trying to push through something and getting stuff done and like you end up with like sometimes not major but something where you're just like if I had just taken my time and done this the right way yeah, yeah like I've I've done a ton of overnight lightnings yeah, like a like 11 p.m. to 3 a.m. call and most of the time you've also worked like the the show before that um, and. You know, it's like why why lift this drop box from the baton when I could just drop it? Yeah. <laughs> because it needs to go away, and it is two a.m. <laughs> like I remember, like I was loaded in this. I think it was a spelling bee set, but like it had um, the back wall and everything. And, like this one flat wasn't matching up, and I had to like kept on going up and down ladders. And I ended up just like trying to rush myself because we were like slightly behind schedule. I miss a run and then like basically take a nice little tumble taking the ladder with me, punching Ooh. a small hole in the flat. So like, <laughs> it was a lovely experience. I was yeah. like, had I just taken my time, first off, I wouldn't have to repair that shit. Mm -hmm. My yeah. knee wouldn't be killing me and, and we wouldn't have a mangled ladder. <laughs> and I think there's also like a certain element in theater of like disregard of personal safety. Like you might be like very conscious yeah. of everyone else's safety, but yeah. when it comes to yourself, you're like, well, you know, I do what I gotta do. And the, the hope is kind of like that others will, will cover you. Like, <laughs> no one's allowed to take care of themselves. You also have to take care of someone else. Yeah. Maybe it's but, like, some people might have, like, issues that you you can, can't can know about. So, like, um, yeah. like, I have a fairly bad back, and, like, I threw my back out on a lighting call and could barely walk for two weeks. But, like, no one else on that lighting call was going to know that about me, you know, off the bat and be, like, looking out for me to not hurt my yeah. back. For me, like, personally, when I'm working, like, doing a call or something like that in the shop, like, <clears throat> I, I, I often find myself getting, the times that I get injured is, like, I'm using the wrong tool in the sense that, like, I'm just like, hey, like, you know, like, I can do this with, like, or anything's a hammer, right? Like, yeah. the, the, <laughs> I can walk the to the tool room. room. The tool room is so far away, I can't go. <laughs> Let me just use something else that's right next to me. And, like, it works, like it'll it'll get done, but like either like the tool wins or <laughs> I win. Like when you're wins. hammering with the screw gun and like the yeah, like the tip is going like this, and you're like, this is so stupid. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get a hammer though. Yeah, but like <laughs> we're human beings. Like that's just a natural instinct. I'm like, no matter how many articles that we write about this, like I'm still gonna do it, and I'm like, sorry, like I'm still gonna be doing dumb things uh, most of the time. Instead of like grabbing like the proper like dollies or something, and just be like, screw it, just gonna manhandle this out the door and just probably throw my back out. I'm gonna hate my life in the morning. Yeah, I just need to get this done now. Like, like I know yeah. it's gonna happen. Yeah, it's yeah. just it's getting so the right cool. tools for the job is probably the most in, like where you fall into getting injured. It's like, like even when like David talks about in class, when he was like, he was like, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't like, uh, what is it, uh, to a bat, you shouldn't spike a bat. No, oh, well, you, uh, you shouldn't. You shouldn't stab a bat, but like, I'm anyway, gonna yeah. do it anyway. It's like, well, see that that, that that that's a bit different. That I wouldn't do because that. Uh, that say. that comes into putting other people in danger, which I think I think most people in theater are fairly good about. But it's just when you're putting when you're only putting yourself in danger, we like, gotta stop caring. Right? So the go, much the go to one of like I'm gonna be up in the TV, just push me around. Yeah, yeah. that's it. I've done that a ton. Like, that's, yeah. yeah, I don't think there's any theater that doesn't do that. No, even so Sean, you just lose your outriggers and drive me around. Sean the has actually fallen over in a genie, and he still does it. And it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, you, you yeah. shouldn't do that. But there's a certain point where, like, I'm never going to tell someone I'm going to send you up. Then I'm going to lose and push you around. No, I'm not going to do that. But, yeah. like, if I'm up there, I'm like, I don't want to come down. Screw it. Just yeah. Push. yeah. Let's just get some closing thoughts. Yeah. Like, we're, we're so so I think I think yeah. for that article, I think Kelly's point was the best, was that, like, since we, we're aware of this attitude in theater, just being extra conscious of looking out for other people and so looking out for each other, I think is, is the most important. Yeah. Agreed.
Yeah. Yeah. Also, you know, make good choices. Just yeah. let you know, kids. That's your <laughs> Anyway, thank you guys so much for listening. Once again, I'm Helena. Kelly. Lauren. Chris. Dave.